Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on Understanding Evolving U.S. Sanctions on Russia. I'd like to introduce Nelson Dong, a partner in Dorsey's National Security Law Group. Take it away, Nelson. Thank you, Sean, and welcome again to the audience today to the Dorsey and webinar on U.S. sanctions measures directed against the Russian Federation and the occupied territories of Ukraine. As Sean said, I'm Nelson Dong, and along with my partner, Larry Ward, in our Seattle office, we're coming to you today from Seattle, Washington, to discuss the very fluid and evolving situation uh, regarding US sanctions and their response of the United States to the military invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation this week. I should say at the outset that although Larry and I are both very experienced lawyers in the field of export controls and economic sanctions, and we practice in this area regularly. We want to be mindful as we approach the subject area in this program today of the actual loss of human life and the destruction that is occurring even as we speak with you today. There are also enormous geopolitical consequences that will flow and economic consequences that will flow, not only for the people of Ukraine and of Russia, but of Europe and much of the world, including the United States. So for that reason, even though it's very important that we cover the subject matter for the sake of international business that's affected by these sanctions measures, we don't wanna lose sight of the broader context that there are many human lives that are going to be affected directly and indirectly by this terrible conflict. And we don't mean to minimize that suffering um, by the things that we're gonna to have to discuss with you today. With that, I'm gonna walk through a few of the introductory slides with you in our program. First, on the housekeeping side, uh, our program today will last 60 minutes. Um, there are materials available for download uh, at the indicated site there, and there are attendance forms as well. Uh, unfortunately, because of the format and time limits in this program, we will not have time for questions and answers, but audience members who have such questions can contact us at the email addresses or phone numbers uh, in the attached materials. Uh, for those in the audience who are attorneys seeking continuing legal education credit, uh, we will announce uh, later in the program a CLE code for any of the attendees who are practicing in states that require such a code. Uh, we at the moment uh, anticipate that we will have a CLE accreditation uh, in the states indicated there. As I said at the outset, Larry and I are going to divide up the, the material here, I will open with the discussion of the background of US sanctions laws. Larry will then take over and cover uh, both the 2014 and current generation of sanctions as of yesterday. Um, then I will cover the export control sanctions that have been imposed both again as of 2014 and as of yesterday and Larry will close with some compliance tips and I will wind up the program as the, at the other end uh, with some concluding remarks. So with that, we will get started with section one of our program. So all of these things that we're discussing today in the United States legal system begin first with action by Congress to enact certain statutes. Three of the statutes that are really fundamental, particularly to the sanctions that Larry will be discussing, derive from three key statutes, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, known in the trade as IEPA, the Trading with the Enemy Act, known as TWIA, and the National Emergencies Act, uh, which I've not heard pronounced, but I guess you would say it could be NIA. Um, those statutes, give permission for the president and the president's delegated authorities, such as secretaries of different cabinet agencies, to carry out sanctions 
in the interest of US national security and foreign policy. The middle column in this slide speaks to other things that influence how sanctions come about. First, the president usually implements sanctions by issuing one or more executive orders. Executive orders are only as good as the authority of the president. And so a subsequent president in another administration can revoke a prior president's executive orders, can modify them, can extend them. Um, and so they're always subject to modification or ending by a successor president. On top of the statutes in the first column on this slide, it is also possible that Congress will come back into the game and order that certain kinds of sanctions be imposed if certain statutory conditions are met. For instance, uh, in 2019, Congress passed a statute called the Protecting Europe's Energy Security Act, or PISA, um, that has direct implications for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project between the Russian Federation and Germany that runs uh, in the Baltic Sea. And so that can also affect how these sanctions get implemented and when they are applicable. Finally, the third basket of legal authority is if the United States signs a solemn obligation either to the United Nations, to allied countries uh, under treaties that have been ratified by the US Senate. Under the US constitutional system, treaties and documents at that level constitute part of the fundamental law of the land are, and so on, are on the same plane, generally speaking, as congressional statutes. There are three key cabinet departments in the US government that have great influence and direct control over the implementation of these sanctions. First and foremost, all the foreign policy advice that guides these sanctions comes from the US Department of State. The economic sanctions that Larry will discuss with you today emanate from a unit within the US Department of the Treasury called the Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC. Finally, the sanctions that I will be discussing uh, are directed by the US Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security, uh, known as BIS. So one other thought is important to keep in mind, or one concept is important to keep in mind as we go forward. By and large, the economic sanctions that Larry will discuss with you that are administered by OFAC center on US persons. And the same can be said of the export control measures that I will be discussing in my portion. So if someone is a US person, then they're fully subject to it. But there are some situations that non-US persons can also be affected by these sanctions. Um, who is a US person? Generally speaking, under the sanctions laws and under the export control laws, a US person includes any US citizen or US permanent resident alien anywhere in the world. It includes any corporation or other business entity formed under the laws of the United States or any state or territory of the United States. It involves any unincorporated branch of such a US business organization in other countries. And it includes any foreign person who is inside the jurisdiction of the United States. So for example, someone who is a European national uh, visiting or working in New York City, while that person is in New York City, that person is also considered a US person. The fact that there is this fluidity about who can be affected by these laws has had serious and evolving uh, consequences 
for foreign subsidiaries of U.S. companies, for the foreign owners of U.S. companies, for foreign companies generally, and particularly for multinational financial institutions. And so Larry will be discussing some of the permutations of these sanctions as they touch upon some of these other people and other entities that are not, strictly speaking, U.S. persons. Finally, the reason that companies and individuals usually pay a lot of attention to where the sanctions are going and what they affect is because there are huge financial penalties attached to these. And in the worst case, there can be criminal prosecutions. That's the case both for the economic sanctions that Larry will discuss, as well as the export control discussions um, that I will be covering in my remarks. Thanks, Nelson. So I'm going to discuss the OFAC sanctions on Russia uh, and how they have evolved over the last nearly decade since President Obama initially implemented some executive orders that authorized the Treasury and State Departments to go ahead and target certain individuals individuals and parties in Russia for sanctions. This session is not designed to be a comprehensive look at OFAC sanctions and the mechanics of precisely how they work. We've assumed that many of you on this call already have that background. And for those of you that don't, uh, this is, is not a session designed to make you an OFAC expert, but instead it's designed to help you understand the immediate effect of the most recent sanctions from this week and how you need to respond to those from, from a compliance perspective. Uh, with that though, I do wanna lay some general background on OFAC sanctions so that it will make sense for the remarks that I'm going to give on the sanctions that have been implemented on Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus this week. Very generally speaking, OFAC has two types of sanctions programs. One is a comprehensive sanctions program. So this essentially acts as a total embargo, meaning that U.S. persons cannot engage in any transactions with the sanctioned country. We've had long-standing comprehensive bar embargoes on countries like Cuba and Iran. More recently, we've had a comprehensive embargo on a region in Ukraine known as Crimea. Uh, and as we'll see, we now have new comprehensive sanctions on additional regions within Ukraine that have been implemented this week. OFAC also has several sanctions programs that are considered targeted or list-based sanctions programs. These really vary widely in terms of what is actually targeted under the program. Sometimes the program is aimed at a country or a region of the world. Other times the program is aimed at particular activities like narcotics trafficking, uh, cyber attacks, those sorts of things. And the sanctions that have been implemented to date against Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus essentially are some combination of these two types of sanctions programs. And we'll look at that in some of the upcoming slides and, and precisely how OFAC is implementing these different sanctions. Generally speaking though, if a country or if a party is sanctioned, it prescribes that US persons or, or anyone that is subject to the jurisdiction of those sanctions can't export to the targeted party, can't re-export to the targeted party, can't import goods or services from that party, can't have any dealings with the party, can't evade or facilitate a foreign person in dealing with that sanctioned party. And there's also, uh, restrictions on dealing with blocked property of those sanctioned individuals and entities. OFAC does recognize that oftentimes when it implements these sanctions programs, although they are designed to target a particular government or particular ruling regime, 
that the impact of the sanctions is often felt hardest by the ordinary citizens within a country or a region. And so for that reason, OFAC does have various exemptions that are drafted into its regulations that allow certain activities to continue with the targeted country or region. So just as an example, there are exemptions for information and informational materials. So the New York Times, for example, can continue to send copies of the newspaper to the regions that are targeted. Uh, that sort of informational material is regarded as protected under the First Amendment. Uh, we desire for the, the individuals in those countries to be able to freely access that sort of information. And so that's the type of activity that OFAC recognizes needs to trump the, the prohibitions under, under the regulations. OFAC also authorizes certain activities under its programs. And it can do that in one of two ways. It can do it through general licenses or specific licenses. A general license is actually written into the regulations or it's posted as a standalone document by OFAC. And it essentially outlines various activities that US persons can engage in despite the fact that they might otherwise be prohibited under the sanctions programs. Those general licenses are oftentimes very complex. There's a host of criteria that have to be satisfied in order for the US person to be able to rely on the license. But if, if you meet those criteria, you can go ahead and engage in the activity. You don't need any further permission from the US government. In other instances, there are situations that could potentially help individuals or groups within sanctioned countries or regions, but they're not actually drafted in, there, there's no permission drafted into the regulations. In those instances, it's possible to apply to OFAC for a specific license. So outlining some sort of activity that a, an entity wants to engage in with a sanctioned party or sanctioned region or country. And OFAC will review that application and determine whether or not the US person can engage in that activity. OFAC in making those determinations is guided by the State Department, it's guided by its own chief counsel, uh, and they have long-standing statements of policy when it comes to many things like humanitarian activities. So these, these decisions on specific license applications are, are dictated by the US government's foreign policy at the end of the day. With that, I want to take a brief look at where things started. Back in 2014, there was obviously civil unrest in Ukraine that was initially implemented by Russia. And at that time, President Obama issued a series of executive orders that authorized the US State Department and the US Treasury Department to go ahead and implement various sanctions on Russia and on certain individuals and entities within Ukraine. When these initial executive orders were implemented back in 2014, they took on elements of both of those types of sanctions programs that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks. So the executive orders authorized OFAC to block property of certain individuals and entities. They also imposed what are referred to as sectoral sanctions, which we'll look at in a moment. These executive orders created what is referred to as the SSI list, and they also imposed a total embargo or a comprehensive sanctions program on the region of Crimea. OFAC later implemented these EOs through the Ukraine-related sanctions regulations or the URSR. And those regulations outline what US persons have to do in terms of asset blocking, in terms of travel bans on particular individuals. The regulations implement the sectoral sanctions and some export restrictions and the comprehensive embargo. From the outset, the US has been very closely tied with the EU in implementing its sanctions. 
both the EU and the United States are entrenched in Russia in a lot of ways. And so this has taken an enormous amount of collaboration between the US government and various EU governments to determine the types of sanctions that should be imposed on Russia. Since the outset of the sanctions, though, there has been a particular focus on oil, gas, exploration, and production with respect to Russia. When OFAC initially implemented these sanctions, they created four directives that essentially outlined the types of activities that US persons could not engage in with particular Russian individuals and entities. Each of the directives targeted a different sector within the Russian economy. So the first directive was targeted at the financial services sector, the second at the energy sector, the third at the defense sector, and then the fourth was very focused on the Arctic offshore or shale projects that have the potential to produce oil in Russia. All of these restrictions have continued since 2014. They continue and are in place today. And most companies have already determined what they need to do to comply with those pre-existing sanctions. When OFAC implemented these sanctions back in 2014, they also implemented what has been referred to as the 50% rule. What this rule means is that any individual or entity that is targeted by sanctions, if those individuals or entities own another entity at 50% or greater interest, that owned entity is also treated as sanctioned. OFAC updates its lists of sanctioned parties to add these entities as they learn of them. But there's been a huge obligation on US companies to make that determination as to whether or not an entity is owned 50% or more by a sanctioned party. The reason that OFAC implemented this guidance is because many of the initial targets of these sanctions were very wealthy, Russian individuals and oligarchs that are entrenched in the international business community. And so they were able to kind of play a shell game and, and try to avoid the sanctions for some time. Um, and so OFAC had to implement this rule so that they could get around some of those creative ways that, that these Russian individuals might try to work around the sanctions. There are various sanctions lists that OFAC maintains and updates on a regular basis that are very important to these Russian sanctions. And I've listed them out here. If your company has commercial screening software, it's going to screen all of these. It's going to alert you as to whether a particular individual or party is included on one of these lists. And then from there, you have to make the determination as to whether or not you can engage in a transaction with that targeted individual or entity. So now moving forward to where we are today, uh, the Biden administration initially implemented an executive order back in April of last year. And this executive order was aimed at blocking property with respect to certain harmful foreign activities of the Russian Federation. Uh, and, and really, this had two aims. Um, it, it was aimed at the Russian efforts to undermine our election process and the democratic election process in allied countries across the world. And it was also aimed at Russia's efforts, ongoing efforts, to engage in and facilitate cyber attacks. President Biden then, in August of last year, signed another executive order with respect to the Russian energy export pipelines. And on to this week uh, that has been extremely active on the sanctions front. Um, so on February 21st, President Biden signed a new executive order 14065. And this executive order immediately did several things. So first, it imposed a total or a comprehensive embargo 
on two regions within Ukraine, the DNR and the LNR. So US companies now must treat these two regions of Ukraine as if they are completely sanctioned, just as they would Crimea. This means that US persons can't make any new investment into these regions, can't export or import any goods or services into these regions, and they also can't approve, finance, or guarantee any transactions with these regions. The executive order also allowed or authorized OFAC to go ahead and identify additional SDNs associated with the unrest in Ukraine. On February 22nd, then, OFAC, through that authority, was able to add two large Russian banks and their subsidiaries to the SDN list. So immediately, they added VEB and PSB to the SDN list. And as you can see on that slide, um, these are two of the largest Russian banks, and they've immediately been treated as totally sanctioned, meaning they are entirely off limits to US persons. OFAC also implemented a directive under Executive Order 14024. And this directive uh, actually is a, a revision to a prior version of Directive 1. Uh, it essentially prohibits US per persons from purchasing Russian sovereign debt traded on secondary markets effective March 1st. And it applies to several key Russian financial institutions and the Russian Ministry of Finance. OFAC also added several prominent Russian individuals and Russian cargo vessels to the SDN list. On Wednesday, just hours before Russia attacked Ukrainian territory, President Biden announced the imposition of blocking sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 entity, uh, the entity that is overseeing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. This entity was already subject to sanctions under the SDN list through PISA, which is the, the statute that Nelson had discussed earlier. But President Biden had issued a waiver of that sanctions designation back in May of last year. This has probably been one of the two biggest issues with our sanctions on Russia because of tensions with the EU and how the US view and the EU view are quite different and, and for quite obvious reasons. The EU, particularly Germany, uh, has a, a, a very keen interest in these energy pipelines from Russia. Germany is where the energy pipelines terminate. Germany will receive much of its energy through these pipelines or was to receive much of its energy through these pipelines. And, and most of Europe was also to receive energy through these pipelines. So the European view as to the importance of this project was quite different from the US congressional view. The other area that we'll, we'll talk about in a moment is the, the SWIFT sanctions that have been considered by the US government um, and, and the EU governments, but not yet implemented. This week, though, President Biden went ahead and reversed his waiver decision as to that entity. And so the sanctions against the entity and its chief executive officer had, took immediate effect. And then just yesterday, OFAC implemented two additional directives under the executive order. The first prohibits, it implements prohibitions related to correspondent or payable through accounts and processing transactions involving certain foreign financial institutions. The immediate target of Directive 2 was Cyberbank and 25 of its subsidiaries and affiliates. It's important to note that Cyberbank has not been added to the SDN list, so it's not totally 
off limits. However, this prohibition on the correspondent or payable through accounts will make it very difficult for US, foreign, US financial institutions and many foreign financial institutions to continue business with Severbank. OFAC also implemented Directive 3 that prohibited US persons from engaging in certain new debt or equity transactions with certain Russian entities effective March 26. The immediate targets of this directive were a host of banks that had received notification from the US government about a month ago um, that they were potentially going to be targeted under this directive. OFAC also took several additional actions yesterday. It added 15 Russian and Belarusian individuals to the SDN list and 70 entities to the SDN list. Many of these are financial institutions or their subsidiaries. OFAC also changed several prior designations of SDNs and it made additions to two of its sanctions lists, the non-SDN menu-based sanctions list and what is referred to as the CAPTA list. With there, I want to pause and turn it to Nelson for one minute. So one of the things that, that the US government did not do and, and has not done with the EU and other governments yet is implement SWIFT sanctions. And I want to turn it to Nelson just to discuss that for a moment. Thanks, Larry. So for those who are not aware of it, when banks make international banking transactions and, and wire transfers of funds between banks, there is a privately owned um, company in Belgium uh, whose acronym is SWIFT. And that organization provides the interbank communications network for messages to go back and forth about how funds are to be managed and transferred between banks. There has been a great deal of discussion both in Europe and in the United States that one of the ways that uh, sanctions could be imposed powerfully against uh, Russia would be to cut off all of Russia's banks from their ability to use SWIFT. And this could be done directly by the European Union uh, since this organization is based in Belgium, which is a member state of the EU, or it could be done indirectly by US action that would create a, a kind of a secondary sanction pressure on SWIFT um, that would force its hand uh, to end the connections for all of the Russian banks. This is a very popular uh, topic on Capitol Hill and certain senior members, particularly in the US Senate, have been calling for action on SWIFT. Um, I believe yesterday, Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the UK also added his voice to suggest that the European Union should take that step, um, keeping in mind, of course, that the UK itself is no longer a member of the EU. Um, and so it's, uh, it can only speak uh, in an advisory way to urge the EU to take that step. There have been many voices speaking both publicly and privately in opposition to that move, primarily because Russia could retaliate against Europe um, by withholding its natural gas and oil if the SWIFT sanction were imposed. And this is really important uh, in sort of two dimensions. For those who are advocating the use of the SWIFT sanction, it's because oil and gas produce about 20% of the GDP of Russia. On the other hand, from the consumer standpoint, Russia supplies uh, roughly 26% of all the crude oil that's refined and used in the European Union and about 38% of all the natural gas. And since we're still in the middle of winter and energy prices have been spiking all over the world, including in Europe, uh, 
if Russia chose to withhold the supply of gas or, or crude oil um, into Europe at this time, that would only add to these really stark inflationary pressures that would affect the pocketbooks of millions and millions of European citizens at the individual and, and industrial level. Indeed, if that kind of plug were pulled, um, it could, in some economists' view, trigger a recession in Europe uh, that would be uh, on top of all of the difficulties that Europe has faced because of COVID. So those are the contesting points of view about uh, SWIFT and why action thus far has not been taken, which President Biden acknowledged at his press conference the other day by saying firmly that although the United States might well favor that, it was aware that its allies in Europe thus far do not. Thanks, Nelson. One last point on the OFAC actions from this week. As I had noted on an earlier slide, OFAC does have the, um, is permitted to authorize certain activities and OFAC has chosen to do that. It has issued 12 general licenses that permit certain activities with the DNR and LNR regions and with other sanctioned parties that, that have been targeted this week. So these general licenses are very detailed. Some of them have, <clears throat> have already changed from their initial draft, um, but they, they generally allow things like allowing US persons to wind down certain activities, particularly related to the Nord Stream project. Um, they allow the official business of certain international organizations. They allow certain transactions with respect to medicines, medical devices, agricultural commodities, um, or if the transaction involves COVID-19. Uh, and they also authorize certain energy transactions. Again, these general licenses are very detailed in terms of the criteria that must be satisfied to use them. But US companies that are within one of the industry sectors that is targeted or that have been doing extensive business um, with Russian entities or within one of these regions in Ukraine can certainly look at these general licenses and determine whether or not they can continue some sorts of transactions. We won't go into a lot of detail uh, with respect to Belarus and the existing sanctions on Belarus, um, but obviously, as many of you saw on the news over the last couple of days, the invasion into Ukraine in large part was through the border with Belarus. And so there have been additional Belarusians added to the SDN list this week. There are some new general licenses that allow certain official business of the US government and certain international organizations with those targeted under the Belarusian sanctions. Um, but that's one key thing to watch here is how OFAC will respond and continue to respond to this developing situation. We may come to a point soon enough where the entire country of Ukraine is treated as comprehensively embargoed. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it to Nelson to discuss the BIS sanctions. Thanks very much, Larry. Um, I am going to do for the Export Administration regulations basically what Larry did for the OFAC, which is to give you some initial preliminary background on the assumption that most of the, you in this audience today are familiar with the basic structure and nomenclature of the EAR. Um, and then I will cover the 2014 measures that were executed by the Obama administration. And then I will bring us forward to the most current measures that have been announced by the Bureau of Industry and Security uh, in the last two days. So at the beginning, um, the EAR or the Export Administration Regulations control the export or re-export of so-called dual use items. Dual use items are technologies or products or software that are mainly intended for commercial or civilian use, but that are capable of being repurposed 
and applied to certain military uses. The ear is administered, as I said at the outset, by the Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, which is an agency within the US Department of Commerce. The core of the ear is something called the Commerce Control List, or the CCL. The CCL consists of 10 large categories, numbered zero through nine, um, that control a range of different kinds of technologies within each of those 10 categories. Uh, for those in the audience today that are in countries other than the United States, the CCL is the US version of the same export control list that has been harmonized and is adopted by all the member states of what are called the Wassenaar arrangement. So most of Western Europe, Japan, Australia, uh, Canada, and many other nations that are members of the Wassenaar arrangement all use the same export control list and indeed use the same numbering system uh, because within the CCL categories is a series of so-called export control classification numbers or ECCNs, each of which carries a distinct description of the items that are subject to control, including their physical or functional characteristics, specifications, you know, uh, things that are this fast or this thick or this heavy uh, are controlled and things below those thresholds are not. It also defines uh, within the ear what degree of control, whether they're very strictly controlled or more loosely controlled in terms of export licensing. The ear also contains a number of specific lists, like the list that Larry was talking about on the OFAC side. The two that are most relevant to our current discussion today are the entity list, which lists organizations that have been named for special treatment under export licensing rules that override what is normally prescribed for an entity or a person in a given country. And then the military end user list, which also has certain overriding functions um, that alter the normal flow of export license requirements under the CCL. So in 2014, as part of the more targeted and, and uh, some would say surgical efforts to apply selective penalties on Russia because of the invasion and occupation and annexation of Crimea, uh, BIS put restrictions specifically on the Russian oil and gas industry. As I noted uh, um, uh, a few minutes ago when Larry let me talk about the SWIFT situation, uh, the oil and gas industry in Russia accounts for about 20% of the GDP. And so the thought behind these measures was that this was intended to inflict pain, but not necessarily crippling pain, just palpable pain to get the attention of the Russian government in the hopes that they would um, back away from, from Crimea. So the 2014 rule provided for special export license requirements for exports to Russia if an exporter or re-exporter knew or should have known that the item being exported would be used in um, three specific kinds of applications in Russia. Uh, deep water, meaning uh, deeper than 500 feet or 152 meters um, in the Arctic offshore area or in any shale projects that would uh, lead to the production of oil or gas in Russia. So if the exporter knew or should have known that that was where the item was going to be used, it would have to get a license. In addition, if the exporter or re-exporter could not figure out if the item would be used that way and the customer was not being cooperative about confirming that, then the default position was they also had to go get a license from BIS. So this was very, very specific. Um, the BIS specified the specific ECCNs that would be affected, uh, and those are listed there in, in this slide. 
in addition to make it easier for exporters to know what was being covered, they supplemented the descriptions of those ECCNs by publishing a separate list of the what are called the Schedule B or harmonized tariff numbers of the products that were covered by these Russian industry sector sanctions. Um, there was a separate measure undertaken in September of 2014 as well, uh, imposing more re export restrictions on military end users and end uses uh, in Russia. And then finally, in 2014, uh, BIS named about 30 Russian companies to the entity list, making them um, subject to export license requirements and adding that those entities would be subject to what BIS calls a policy of denial. And we're gonna talk over and over again in the rest of these slides about policy of denial. What that means is that if an application shows up at BIS that is subject to a policy of denial, BIS officials will begin with a presumption that the application should be denied and has to see evidence in the application to override that presumption. It's not as if the application arrives and BIS is neutral. They begin automatically opposed to the application and the applicant then has to make a special case why in spite of that presumption, the license should be granted. The net effect of a policy of denial usually is denial uh, because generally speaking, applicants usually don't carry that burden of persuasion and can't persuade BIS to overcome that policy. So uh, this week on February 24th, uh, BIS really went much further than they did in 2014, well beyond oil and gas, and imposed a whole series of changes to the export licensing for exports and re-exports to Russia. Um, the stated goal in particular was to hamper Russian technology-based industries, specifically those in the defense, the aerospace, and the maritime sectors. Um, I will go into the details of each of these uh, a little bit more in individual slides to come, but the overview is that the first element was that of the 10 categories in the CCL, seven of those categories now will be subject entirely to an export license requirement for exports to Russia, whereas individual ECCNs might or might not have spelled out a requirement for exports to Russia previously. Now, as a blanket rule, every single ECCN in those 10 categories, notwithstanding what it says individually, will now be subject to export licensing. So that's a very significant uh, uptick in licensing requirements for exports to Russia. Larry, could you go back, please? Um, in addition, um, there will be now special rules on military end users and end uses. Um, there are two new versions of the foreign direct product rule that we'll talk about. Um, they have limited the ability of American companies to rely on license exceptions, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then finally, uh, there had been sort of an alert to American exporters that certain Russian entities were considered by the US government to be military end users within the context of Russia. Now those are moved over formally from just the alert list to the entity list, uh, which puts them fully subject to the export licensing and the policy of denial. So now we'll go through these in one by one. All right, so for those of you who are exporters in the audience today, you will generally know which category your products are, or services are in um, because that's the first digit of the ECCNs that apply to your company's products. So these are the categories that have been added to this blanket rule of requiring all ECCNs, every single one in these categories to be subject to export licensing if the end user or end use is, is in Russia. 
And as you can see, these are fairly large buckets uh, of dual use controls. Um, with very few exceptions, on top of the fact that now export licensing is required, BIS announced that they will apply policy of denial to applications, which generally means that these are um, sort of dead on arrival applications unless the applicant has a very strong case to make. I think probably fewer of the members of the audience will be worried about exporting to military end users and end uses in, in Russia. So I'll kind of let this slide speak for itself, but it simply says that virtually everything of US origin, anything that's quote, subject to the ear, unquote, will require export licensing and will be uh, scrutinized very carefully. Next. The foreign direct product rules are well beyond the scope of this one session. The FTP rules are some of the most complicated rules in all of the year. We'll simply say that there is now a new special Russian FTP rule on top of the existing FTP rules that were in um, the uh, year before this week. And this will not only cover um, foreign made goods made with uh, US controlled technology, but also uh, the content that goes into foreign made products will be subject to these rules as well. And then there is a super rule on top of that that deals with the Russian military. And so we suggest that you either look at an article that we will be releasing soon that will try to explain some of these complexities or there are BIS materials that are in the attachments for today's program that will explain these in more detail. In the structure of the ear, there are many occasions that the ear provides flexibility on avoiding the need for a BIS export license if the export transaction meets the criteria of uh, a certain stated exception. This is sort of an, an analog to the general license that Larry spoke of about OFAC sanctions. So if an exporter can read the license exception rule and the transaction because of the end use, the end user and the product all fit within one of these written exceptions, then they can go ahead and ship uh, without applying for a license. The measures announced this week now cut off most of those license exceptions and are limiting now exporters to rely only on the ones that are shown in the second bullet here, which are really pretty innocuous, um, such as BAG, which means you continue to carry your carry-on bag and your laptop computer and smartphone with you if you were to travel to, to Russia. I mean, these are really, really small, tiny license exceptions all the important ones that are more meaningful have been taken off the table. Um, license exception ENC, which covers information security, um, like SSL encryption and things like that, um, will also be taken off the table if the end user turns out to be part of the Russian government or a Russian state-owned enterprise. The net effect of doing this is yet again, to force more transactions into the export licensing line at BIS and to make them eligible to be turned down by the policy of denial. Um, the final step uh, of this raft of measures taken this week was to move um, 47 entities from the military end user list and put them on the entity list um, so that uh, anybody in the United States providing anything subject to the ear, including even the so-called ear 99 item, uh, will have to apply for a BIS export license and they will face a policy of denial. So basically these 47 Russian entities are now cut off from access to anything subject to the ear. In addition to these 47, there were two other entities on Russia that were named for the first time to the military end user list. So in total, 
this bucket of, of measures affected 49 Russian entities. And with that, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up in a, a compliance tips and conclusions section. Obviously, one of the most important steps this week immediately for, for US companies is going to be to conduct a risk assessment. So what business do they have with Russia currently? What business do they have with these new regions of Ukraine that have been targeted? And implement proper internal controls once they've, they've determined that risk assessment. Other steps within sanctions compliance would obviously go ahead and flow after you've done that risk assessment and determined the controls that are necessary. I'll close with just a few key takeaways for US companies and then Nelson will close with what else might be coming. We realize we've got about three minutes left. Uh, we will get through this as quickly as we can. We will not go over five minutes long, but understand if some people do need to drop off a, a, a minute or two early. The implementation of the sanctions this week is exceedingly complex. Uh, so for most companies, it's really gonna take some time to dive through these new changes and determine exactly the impact on the company. Um, on an immediate basis though, US persons need to treat these two occupied regions of Ukraine just as they do Crimea, just as they do Cuba, Iran, or any other comprehensively embargoed country. That may continue to change. The entire country of Ukraine may soon become comprehensively embargoed. It's really important to look at any existing agreements that you may have with Russian, Belarusian, or Ukrainian counterparties to determine what those agreements require of you and whether you're actually to, able to fulfill requirements. Most importantly for, for US companies, oftentimes is getting paid for services or goods that are gonna be, be um, shipped to any of these regions. And so determining, are you gonna be able to get paid under, under these new sanctions regimes is gonna be critically important. Even if your transaction is nominally allowed under these sanctions changes, many US companies have uh, existing financing arrangements that may impose further burdens on them beyond what is required under the sanctions. So it's really important to look at your financing arrangements and make the determination whether or not you might actually be breaching obligations under those arrangements. And importantly, any future financing arrangements with US banks, you're going to have to really delve into whether or not you would have issues um, with these new sanctions. Supply chain issues that have already been problematic because of COVID-19 and because of unrest in this region of the world are likely to become even more difficult. And importantly, we have to note that there is certainly the possibility of Russian retaliation through cyber attacks. The US government has already indicated that finan US financial institutions, energy companies, and power grid operators are perceived to be the most likely targets for those attacks. And I'll turn it back to Nelson to just find, uh, give some final comments on what else might be coming. So we are lawyers and not fortune tellers, but we will do our best here to give you some over the horizon perspective. We suspect based on public statements and fairly strong domestic political pressure in all of these countries, that the US, the European Union and many other allied countries are going to continue to ramp up sanctions uh, on Russia and the occupied territories in the coming weeks. Uh, and they will continue to follow the two tracks that Larry and I have outlined today. That is, some will be aimed at transactional or financial type sanctions, and then there will be also more efforts to control the export of technology and technology products or the direct products of such technologies in other countries. Um, there will be growing legislative pressure, I think, in many jurisdictions, um, whether it's the U.S. Congress here or the U.K. Parliament, um, that will try to push the executive leaders to take even harsher or stronger measures. I mentioned, for instance, the disagreement uh, among national leaders about whether to use the SWIFT sanction or, or not. Um, Larry and I are both watching the news almost every hour, and obviously the situation militarily within Ukraine is quite grave, 
as Russian forces seem to continue to take more territory, including even a threat to the national capital in Kyiv. So there could well be a situation in the coming days or weeks when the Ukrainian government may have to surrender in order to avoid further bloodshed and for further loss of life. And so if that happens and Ukraine becomes uh, under the de facto control of the Russian Federation, it's possible that the same controls that Larry outlined a moment ago about embargoes that have been imposed on Crimea, um, LHR and DNR will be applied to the whole country. That remains to be seen. I don't think any responsible leaders anywhere in the world believe that any of these kind of sanctions are going to alter Russian behavior, and that's really not their goal. I think the goal here is simply to paint for the Russian government and to some extent the Russian people the cost that will be paid for continuing this war in Ukraine. The final point that Larry and I would make is that despite all of the hardship that may be caused both in the target um, of these sanctions and even in the United States and Europe and elsewhere, it's possible none of these sanctions will have any effect, particularly if any other large national party that has wealth, that has technology, that has power, and I will avoid naming any particular country, but if there are countries that are more sympathetic to Russia and are willing to do business in a way that defeats these embargoes and sanctions, then Russia may feel little or no pain in spite of all these efforts. And so that remains to be seen as part of the geopolitical equation that we'll watch unfold over the next uh, few months. With that, I think we thank you for attending. Here are some final housekeeping details that you can uh, contact us, contact uh, Dorsey and Whitney about accreditation or CLE credits. And a reminder that if you are watching this program in a recorded form rather than live, that you may not be able to obtain CLE credit in some jurisdictions. With that, we thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we wish everyone um, a safe day and peace in the world.